Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. We all have our Bibles today. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Just keep it open there in front of you. Um, Today we've reached that time of the year that we all understand it to be Christmas. And um, it's the end of the year. It's that that season of the year where uh, everybody is preparing for celebration. But I'm here to share with everybody a Christmas message you don't want to hear. That's the title of my sermon this morning. A Christmas message you don't want to hear. Now, I know, and we, you know, that in this world right now, people are preparing for Christmas. It's everywhere. On your TV, in the newspapers, or, you know, websites, advertising, billboards. It's everywhere. Especially when you walk down the street, you know, perhaps, and you're seeing uh, shop fronts or shopping centers. It's everywhere, Christmas, you know. Walk into shopping centers and you see the, the big Santa Claus uh, throne and, uh, you know, parents with their children lining up, uh, eagerly looking for a photo. Um, it's everywhere, you know. It's perhaps one of the busiest times of the years economically, financially, um, it's booming, and so everybody's preparing. You know, they're getting their um, their turkeys ready, or whoever. You know, their preparations. They're calling families. They're decorating trees, getting gifts ready. It's happening. We've reached this area, uh, this season. But we know as Christians that these things are wrong. We know that no one can come to you today and say to you you know, believe in Santa Claus and, you know, buy yourselves Christmas presents, put, put up trees, um, you know, believe in reindeers and all, you know, all of these other fables and myths that we all understand. Um, we know that these things uh, wouldn't impress you and they certainly wouldn't lead you away to do them. But I'm not here to talk about those things. Because we can see from afar that these things have no relevance to the Bible. But I want to speak to you about Christians and their understanding of Christmas. Because there are a lot of Christians in the world today that still celebrate Christmas without the tree, without the gifts, without Santa Claus, without stockings, mistletoes, yule logs, without all of that jazz, right? that the world advertises. But there are still many Christians that say, I will still celebrate Christmas because I want to get back to the real meaning of what Christmas is about, the birth of Jesus Christ. And there are a lot of Christians that still celebrate this season. right? They still celebrate the birth of Christ. They still hold into their hearts that perhaps it's December 25th that Jesus was born and they still feel that, hey, look, I don't need what the rest of the world is throwing at me, but I'm going to get back to the real meaning and I'm going to use that as an opportunity to preach to other people about who Jesus is. But this, this is the, where I want to get to because the Bible gives us an outline, it indicates to us truly what a, how a Christian should live, how he, what he should believe, what he should celebrate. And we don't see Christians in the Bible celebrating the birth of Christ. Now, a lot of, a lot of Christians may say, well, does it really matter? Is it that important? You know, perhaps we can use it as an opportunity to reach people with the message of the gospel, you know, and to be able to bring them back to the true meaning of Christmas. And this is what I'm here this morning to share with you. I'm here to outline to you truly when was the birth date of Jesus Christ. 
I'm here to share this with you. And I'm going to share with you afterwards how December 25th and this whole idea of Christmas came to, came to be in the church. I'm not here to speak to you folks about Santa Claus and, and all this other stuff. Even though I'm going to touch on this. I'm here to speak to Christians who still believe they can celebrate Christmas because of the birth of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm here to share with you. I'm here to share with you that the Bible does not prove Jesus Christ was born December 25th. I will prove to you this morning through the Bible when Jesus was born. Do you, do you know when Jesus was born? Do you know? You know, because the, because the world, the church says he was born December 25th. And a lot of Christians undoubtedly just go, well, that's fine with me. Do you know when he was born? Do you know when your Messiah, when your Savior, when your Lord was born? Now clearly there's no verse in the Bible that will say to you, he was born, you know, on this month, this year, this day. No, there isn't. But with a little bit of investigation, with a little bit of research, we can accurately ascertain when he was born. And so this is what we're going to do this morning. Luke chapter 1, we begin our reading here, from verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a certain priest named Zacharias, of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, both righteous in the sight of God, walking blameless in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it came about while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division. According to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. By the Lord, sorry. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right altar of incense. And Zacharias was troubled when he saw him, and fear gripped him. And the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. He'll be great in the sight of the Lord and he'll drink no wine or liquor and he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this for certain? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you'll be silent and unable to speak until the days when these things take place because you did not believe my words which shall be fulfilled in their proper time. And the people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And it came about when the days of his priestly service were ended that he went back home. And after these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant and she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. Now, this is where we begin our investigation in determining the birth of Jesus Christ. But mind you, in the process of doing this, we're going to discover one more thing. We are going to discover the birth date of John the Baptist. Do you know when John the Baptist was born? Okay, let's begin here. We begin with his father, Zacharias. He was a priest serving in the temple. Pay attention now in uh, verse 5. He was serving as priest according to the division of of Abijah. Now that is a sign because immediately we can understand from the Old Testament about the priestly order found in 1 Chronicles. Go with me to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Sorry, not 29. Sorry, did I say 29? I said 24. 1 Chronicles 24. Um, Now 
Now, in 1 Chronicles chapter 24, we see David beginning to organize uh, the priesthood. And it says, from verse 1, <clears throat> Now the divisions of the descendants of Aaron were these. The sons of Aaron were Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. But Nadab and Abihu died before their father and had no son. So Eleazar and Ithamar served as priests. And David with Zadok of the sons of Eleazar and Ahimelech of the sons of Ithamar divided them according to to their offices for, the, for their ministry. Since more chief men were found from the descendants of Eleazar than the descendants of Ithamar, they defi- divided them thus. There were 16 heads of father's households of the descendants of Eleazar and eight of the descendants of Ithamar according to their father's households. Now just stop there. David divided the heads of the sons of Eleazar and Ithamar 16 on one side and 8 on the other. 24 divisions. Did you see that with me? 24 divisions of the priesthood. It says further down, Thus they were divided by lot, the one as the other, for they were officers of the sanctuary and officers of God, both from the descendants of Eleazar and the descendants of Ithamar. <clears throat> and it says, go down to verse 7. It says, now the first lot came out for Jehorib, the second of Jehida. And if you read from verses 7 all the way down to verse, um, where is it, verse 30, he lists the 24 divisions of the priesthood. Right? Go with me now to verse, um, to verse 10. Verse 10, look what it says. The seventh was Hakoz, the eighth was... Abijah. Abijah was the eighth division of the priesthood within the 24 that King David um, divided. So please understand this. The way the priest, the Levitical priesthood worked in the temple was this. right? That, with, that the 24 divisions of the priesthood would take turns serving in the temple. Does that make sense? In, in Luke chapter 1... At the time that Zacharias was serving in the temple, it was because it was the division of Abijah that, was, that, um, that had the right at that time to serve in the temple. You see, So it went by rotation, in other words. There were 24 divisions. It started from the top and they would work their way down you know, all through the 24 divisions. So each, each, uh, each division of priests got a chance to serve in the temple. Does that make sense? Okay. How do we know how long they served? Okay. Go with me now to Second Chronicles chapter 23. This is good background so you can understand now. Second Chronicles 23. How long did each of the 24 divisions of the priesthood serve in the temple? Well, in Second Chronicles chapter 23, we get an idea. 2 Chronicles chapter 23, verse 8. So, are we all there? 2 Chronicles 23. So the Levites, verse 8, and all Judah did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded. And each one of them took his men who were to come in on the Sabbath with those who were to go out on the Sabbath. For Jehoiada the priest did not dismiss any of the divisions. Now, to you, how do you understand this? Clearly, Jehoiada did not dismiss the service of the Levitical divisions. As a matter of fact, he indicates that they were to serve seven days, from one Sabbath through to the other. So for seven days, each of the divisions of the 24 priesthood would serve seven days in the temple. So you would start with the first division, that would serve seven days in the temple. Then that would be dismissed, and then the second division of priests would come and serve in the temple for the next seven days working your way all the way down through the 24 divisions and then you'd start again from the top work your way down does that make sense okay now when did they start at what time of the year would the priesthood start their service in the temple well it's clear that they would start at the beginning of the religious calendar 
at the beginning of the Jewish religious calendar, the priesthood would start their service. Does that make sense? Now, I'm going to go into it a little bit about the Jewish calendar, the Jewish religious calendar, because Jews hold two calendars. They hold the religious calendar, and then they hold the civil calendar. We're looking at the religious calendar, because that is how the priesthood function, according to the religious calendar. Now, we know there's 12 months in a year. We know there's approximately 30 days a month. I'm talking about the Jewish calendar. Don't think of today's calendar, our calendar. We're talking Jewish calendar. All right? Now, if you've got 30 days in a month, then, and you've got 7 days that each division served, if you go 30 divided by 7, you've got four, 4 divisions a month. Does that make sense? 4 divisions a month. 30 divided by 7 is an approximately 4 a month. So every month, four divisions served per month. Okay, so let's look at this. The first month of the Jewish calendar is the month of Nisan. Nisan corresponds to the middle of March to the middle of April. Within the middle of March to the middle of April, you had the first four divisions, which were Jehoarib, Je- Jediah, Harim, and Seorim. Then in the second month, you had the month of Iya, which is the middle of April to the middle of May. There you had Malkija, Mijanim, Hakoz, and Abijah. Oh, now we know when Zacharias was serving. He was serving um, in the middle of the month of May. Oh, we've got our month. Apparently now, Abijah, the division of Abijah, was serving in the middle of the month of May. And it's here in the month of May that the angel Gabriel came into the temple and spoke to Zacharias. And he says, your wife will fall pregnant. He brought him the word of promise. Right? In the middle of May. Pay attention to that. Right? The middle of May. So the angel speaks to, to him about Elizabeth's conception in a womb. Zacharias finishes his seven days, you know, of his priestly duty in the temple, right? And then the Bible says, if you, let's go back to Luke chapter 1, let's go back to Luke chapter 1, we're going to read verses here careful, so we can understand what's happening. In Luke chapter 1, verse 23, of Luke chapter 1, And it came about when the days of his priestly service were ended that he went back home. So he finished his seven days of service in the temple in the middle of May. Does that make sense? Right? He goes back home to be with his wife. Now, usually a woman has a 28-day cycle. Right? True? So from the middle of May, if you add 28 days, 30 days... That gives you the middle of June, right? And what does it say here now in verse um, 24? And after these days, Elizabeth, his wife, fell pregnant. So it's reasonable to assume that Elizabeth fell pregnant to John the Baptist in the middle of the month of June. Right? Elizabeth, right? Elizabeth fell pregnant, right? with John the Baptist in the middle of June. Right? Middle of June. Okay. So, with that in mind, we can now begin to trace what, uh, what's happening with Jesus. But pay attention. John the Baptist was conceived in the middle of June. Right? Now, verse 30 of Luke chapter 1. Read it with me. Now the angel Gabriel comes to Mary. And he says to her, and the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God, and behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob, and his kingdom will have no end. So now the angel comes to Mary and announces that she also will fall pregnant supernaturally with the Christ, right? Now, how long after Mary fell, uh, Elizabeth fell pregnant does this event occur? Well, the Bible gives us another indication. It's found in verse 26 and 36. Verse 26 of Luke chapter 1 says this, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel 
was sent from God to a city in Galilee. Verse 36. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. Ooh. Now, if Elizabeth fell pregnant in the middle of June, add six months, when did Mary fall pregnant? December. Jesus wasn't born in December. Mary was pregnant in December. Does that make sense? This is, these are things a lot of people don't know. But this is what the Bible teaches. That Elizabeth fell pregnant in the middle of the month of June. And six months into her pregnancy, the angel Gabriel came to Mary, this is December now, and said to her that you will now fall pregnant. In December, she fell pregnant. She didn't give birth in December. She fell pregnant in December. Does that make sense? All right. So, with that in mind, folks, and for you know, the sisters here that are mothers, how long is a full-term pregnancy? Nine months, isn't it? Nine months. So let's pay attention here. If Elizabeth fell pregnant in the middle of the month of June, and a full-term pregnancy is nine months, when was John the Baptist born? Well, if you add nine months from June, he was born in the middle of March of the next year. Right? John the Baptist was born in the middle of March, which is the first month of the year, the year of Nisan, and very coincidentally, um, the time of the Passover. That has huge, huge theological ramifications, and I'll explain to you why. For those that don't understand the Passover, right? It was customary in the Jewish Passover that during the feast, Jews, before they would partake of the lamb, they would drink four cups of wine. I've taught this in my, in the, in my, in my studies in times past of the Jewish feasts. Jews during the feast of Passover would drink four cups of wine, right? in commemoration of God's four redemptive promises made in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Please write that down. I want you to read it in your own time. We, 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 we won't read it today. But in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, God gave four redemptive promises to Israel while they were in bondage in Egypt. Right? And obviously God, through the hand of Moses, came to fulfill the, the, uh, God, uh, the plan of redemption. Right, And so that's why today, Jews, when they celebrate the Feast of Passover, and their celebration goes for like two, three hours, right? When they sit at the table to eat, they don't sit there for half an hour. It go, it's, a, it's a feast that runs for like three, four, two, three, four hours. And during those, those four hours, in the course of the four hours, they, they commemorate their redemption out of Egypt by drinking four cups of wine. Right, based on the four redemptive promises made in Exodus six verses six and seven. Right, but during the feast, they then began to introduce a fifth cup. Right, a fifth cup. This fifth cup was called the cup of Elijah. Right, and they believed they did this in honor, right, of the one who would come to herald in the Messiah. Did you hear what the angel Gabriel said to Zacharias? That John would come in the spirit and power of Elijah? Yeah? Go with me to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. It says, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes... And ordinances which I command him in Horeb and all Israel. This is Malachi chapter 4 verse 4. And then he says, Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with the curse. Well, hold on. If, he, if God was going to send Elijah... And he spoke this word to Malachi. Well, Elijah had been dead hundreds of years. 
So what's he talking about here? He wasn't literally going to send the Elijah the prophet. He was saying that he's going to send one who would come in the spirit and power of Elijah. In other words, I'm going to send you a man who will come to do a work similar to Elijah the prophet. Right? And Elijah the prophet, as we know, came to you know, herald in the word of God. To come to herald in God's promise. And bring the nation back to repentance. That was Elijah's ministry. To bring national repentance back to Israel. And now if you go with me to Matthew 17. Turn with me now to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17 verse 10. Matthew 17 verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. And the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Who came in the power and spirit of Elijah? It was John the Baptist. And therefore, because John the Baptist came with a very similar ministry that Elijah the prophet had, and what was his message? He was announcing repentance, national repentance to Israel. Why? Because he was the one that was going to usher in Messiah. Well, he did so. Because through his ministry, the Christ came. He baptized Jesus. And at his baptism, he was identified as the Son of God, as the Christ. Because the the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove and remained on him. And it was a sign to everyone that, hey, through the ministry of John the Baptist, the Messiah would be revealed. And so therefore, John the Baptist had to be born during the Passover. Because it it was the hope of every Jew that during Passover... Elijah would come. Wow. God's timetable on the, came on, on that very day. Can you see? To, 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 to change these things is to muddle up God's timetable. No. Clearly, John the Baptist was born in the middle of March, which means Elizabeth fell pregnant in the middle of June, which means that Mary conceived in December. Six months after Elizabeth, according to the angel Gabriel's words. Does that make sense? Can you see how it's all coming together? We can ascertain today, right, these things. It just requires a bit of homework. Now, with that in mind, when was Jesus was born? Well, if Mary was conceived in December, add nine months to a full-term pregnancy, where, where does that leave you? Sept- middle of September. Middle of September, which according to the Jewish religious calendar is the month of Tishri, it's called, which apparently, and very coincidentally, brings you to the Feast of Tabernacles. Now what is the significance of the Feast of Tabernacles? I'll get into it right now. The Feast of Tabernacles was the seventh feast in Israel and was the most joyous feast of the seven. Because for seven days, God ordered His people to leave their homes, get out of your house, and build yourself a temporary booth called a Sukkot. Right? It was made of branch leaves. And they were to live in it for seven days to remember their wilderness journeys for 40, for 40 years. But it was, it was a, a, a feast of joy and celebration. They would cut palm branches and celebrate Because, you know, God had delivered them and God was with them. That was the celebration. God is with us. That was the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. And what do we see? Go with me to John chapter 1, verse 14. John 1, 14. We've read this. But this will make perfect sense to you right now in John chapter 1, verse 14. Because the Word became flesh and He dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, 
Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. A skinny say. He tabernacled among us. You see, the word tabernacled or dwelt in the Greek, like a tent. He pitched his tent in our midst. And uh, folks, there are a lot of people that have so grossly misinterpreted this verse. You know, a lot of people see God came and took human form to tabernacle among us. No, that is not that is not what the Bible says. God never, ever in all of human history, you know, took on himself, you know, some, some sort of physical matter in order to dwell among us. No. Just like Moses erected a tabernacle so that God's glory and God's presence may be in their midst, so he did so again. God raised up his son Jesus. And through His Son, God was going to be with His people again. Because it was the Word that became flesh. It was not God becoming a God-man or, or, become, or taking on human form the way people out there, you know, like Trinitarians or Oneness Pentecost. See, God became a man. No, God did not become a man. God raised up His Son. And through His Son, His glory was revealed and His presence was revealed. It says the Word became flesh. The Word is God expressing Himself, revealing Himself. Jesus was the embodiment of everything that God was uttering and speaking in the Old Testament. And God's words point back to Himself. You see, in Matthew, you don't need to turn there, One twenty-three. The, uh, the angel said, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. You shall call his name Emmanuel. That's God with us. You see, because Jesus Christ embodied God's plan, he embodied everything that God was speaking about. When Jesus Christ came along and he was speaking God's words and, God, and doing God's miracles, God was in their midst. In, in prophecy, in power, and every time Jesus was functioning and working, he was revealing God to the people. And everybody was praising God, saying God has truly visited his people. Just like in the Old Testament, when Moses re returned back to Egypt in the power of God, with God's anointing, and people realized God has now visited us by answering our prayers. So God has done the same thing. God truly you know, in Christ has visited his people. You see? Jesus Christ was that human tabernacle, you know, by which God could come and visit his people again. And this is why Jesus Christ had to be born during the Feast of Tabernacles. Because he came to dwell amongst his people so that God in Christ could be with his people again. Does that make sense? This is the wonderful plan and timetable of God to take that, to, to rip that out of its historical setting and say that, well, Jesus was born December 25th. It's to tear away God's timetable and plan from the pages of Scripture. It, it doesn't mention it. You know, people say, well, does it really matter? Of course it matters. If it's not found in here, it matters. If you're not within the parameters of Scripture, it matters. You see? And people must be careful to understand God's timetable. Jesus could not. It was a, an impossibility for him to be born December 25th. He was born September in accordance with the Feast of Tabernacles. You see? God was expressing himself permanently, fully, through Jesus Christ. He was the human tabernacle. So, with that in mind, I want to share with you for the next 10 minutes, why? Why has December 25th been the chosen date, the most traditional chosen date for the church? I'm not speaking about the world right now, I'm speaking about the church. Because there are multitudes of Christians that still say in their hearts, 
well, I still want to celebrate Christmas. I don't want to do all the fancy, all the fancy jazz of the world. I just want to get back to the real spirit of Christmas, the birth of Christ. But guess what, folks? Jesus wasn't born December 25th. So you've missed the date by like three months. Jesus was born in September. In the middle of September, in accordance with the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles, God purposed it like that for a reason. He doesn't follow Gentile, you know, programs. God does his own programs. So, why was December 25th chosen? Well, I'm going to take you for the next 10 minutes through a little bit of history. Please um, bear with me a little bit. It's believed this date was set by early religious leaders who were influenced by the pagan celebrations of the winter solstice. You've heard of this, these terms. That was a festival that occurred around middle to late December. Now, most pagan cultures in the ancient world worship the sun. You know, the sun. Considering it to be the sun god. They believed winter ended the sun god's rule and allowed evil powers of darkness to take over. As the days grew shorter and the nights longer in winter, that's what happens during winter, they feared the sun god would not return. This is the way pagans understood these things. Late December, though, was a turning point in the northern hemisphere I'm talking about now. The days would begin to grow longer and more sunlight. That's what happens. For us, it happens in the southern hemisphere in the middle of June, I think, somewhere. Yeah? Hence, people held festivals to welcome the sun god's return. They lit candles and bonfires to make the sun god stronger and to drive winter away. Variations of this festival can be seen in cultures like Mesopotamia, Egypt, Babylon, Persia, Greece and Rome. They all had this middle of December festival. I'll share with you a couple of them. The Roman Empire held a special winter solstice holiday on December 25th called Saturnalia, which honoured Saturn, the Roman god of agriculture. There was an actual holiday on December 25th. On this holiday, people indulged in much eating, much drinking and revelries, even to the point of riots on the street. Celebrations included visiting friends, giving them good wishes for the coming year and the exchange of gifts. Sounds very, very common to today. Some even carried small trees trimmed with candles to welcome the sun's return. Sounds very common to today. In Scandinavia, this great festival was called the Yule and they would gather around a fire burning Yule log. Have you ever heard people do burn Yule logs today? Especially in Northern Europe, they still do it, to, do it today. Great bonfires were lit to celebrate the return of the sun. These, all these practices that you see today originated from pagan nations in their attempt to welcome back a false deity. So how did the church eventually settle on the date of December 25th? As the birth date of Christ. I'll tell you right now. To many people, listen carefully, back thousands of years, especially in the infancy of the Christian church, to many people back then, 2,000 years ago, religion meant festivals, ceremonies, and revelries. Right? So, if someone wanted to say to you, what's your religion, and you told them, this is my religion, the essence of how good your religion was, was, are there many festivals? Are there many ceremonies? How much revelries and eating and drinking are there? That was the essence of religion back then, right? Now, obviously, um, Christianity during didn't have any of those. There were no revelries. <laughs> there were no ceremonies. You know, there weren't any, any feast days, festivals. So, to a lot of pagans, they're like, man, your religion's quite bland. Yeah, your religion's quite shallow, you know? Because to pagans, that was really the essence of religion, 
how many festivals and ceremonies and so forth, right? So, you know, prior to the 3rd century, there was no documented evidence that any celebration of Christmas on December 25th occurred by anyone in the church. There was, there's no evidence, folks. You read church history, you will not find any evidence within the first 300 years of anyone celebrating Christmas or the birth of Christ on December 25th. No evidence at all. So, what happened? The first documented evidence is this. In 137 AD, Pope Hyginus ordered the birthday of Christ to be celebrated on January 6th. Have you heard of this? On January 6th, in 137 AD, this Pope pretty much stood up and said, from here onwards, we're going to annually celebrate the birthday of Jesus Christ, January 6th. Right? He's the first person that came along. He never even, this is the first Christian Pope, right, who came up with this. It wasn't even December 25th. He put it down on January 6th. This became known as the Feast of Nativity. Have you heard of that? The Feast of, Nat- of Nativity? Right? A, a lot of, I think, East, uh, Coptic Orthodox still celebrate the birth of Christ January 6th. They look at most of the church and they go, mate, you guys have succumbed to paganism. We're sticking to January 6th. That's the birthday of Christ because of this Pope that brought this in at 137 AD. A special service this guy created called Mass was celebrated to honour the Nativity. This newly introduced festival slowly spread throughout the church with many Christians now observing Christ's birthday annually. So from 137 onwards now, for some reason, many Christians started celebrating the birth of Christ on January 6th. Now, by the to- this time, the church was facing an, in- an invasion of pagan customs by philosophically converted Gentiles. There were many <coughs> Gentiles coming to repentance in Christ Jesus. They began bringing in their philosophies into the church and their pagan practices in the church. And now the church was suffering a crisis. All of these pagan things, all these pagan. Uh, you know, traditions and and thinking were coming into the church. And how could the church deal with this invasion? How do you deal with it? When so many converts coming in were bringing their philosophies in, how could the church deal with with this invasion? Well, rather than stamping it out, they transformed the pagan festivals where possible to give them a Christian significance. That's what happened, folks. Rather than the church leaders standing up and saying, no, get this out of the church, they said, well, we can't stop it for fear of offense. Let's repackage it and give it a Christian significance. Now the church eventually began to embrace festivals, lights, trees, gifts in their celebration of Christmas. Do you see it today? How many Christians... Genuine, sincere Christians, when you walk into their home, have a tree, have candles, gifts, they sing carols, they believe Jesus was born December 25th. How many, do, how many have them? There are many out there that do this. Church historian, listen to this, church historian Moshim wrote concerning this problem. Right At the time, the pagans had been accustomed to numerous and splendid ceremonies from their infancy. And when they saw the new religion of Christianity to be destitute of such ceremonies, they thought it too simple. The Christians were pronounced atheists because they were destitute of altars, temples, priests, and all the pomp which the pagans supposed to be the essence of religion. To silence this accusation, the Christian leaders thought they must introduce some of the rites and ceremonies which would strike the senses of the people. Did you hear that? In a nutshell, he said, Christianity was too bland in order to win converts to Christ. So quick, bring in the altars, bring in the temples, bring in the ceremonies, bring in the gifts. Perhaps we can draw them away from their paganism. But to do that, we have to become, quote-unquote, pseudo-pagans ourselves. 
Did you see what happened? To bring legitimate, uh, sorry, Christians at an alarming rate were celebrating Christ's birth with pagan customs adopted from Saturnalia. After a brief opposition from leaders, eventually it was decided that the celebration would be made to fit around the belief of the Son of God, not the Son God. Did you get that? Tragedy. This is tragedy, folks. Tragedy on a mass scale. To bring legitimacy to the celebration of Christ's birth, they felt it only necessary to move it from January 6th to December 25th. In alignment with the celebration of Saturnalia, so that the rest of the population may join in with the church. To the church, though, they saw it as an opportunity at last to turn the, those pagans away from their evil ways to a feast that adored the Christ, the Lord. Did you get that? That's how we win converts to Christ now. We Christianize their pagan festivals and we draw them away from their paganism. But we've got to become pagans ourselves. Did you get that? You can't win converts anymore with the gospel. You can't bring a wholehearted repentance. We've got to Christianize their celebrations. We've got to try and introduce Christian significance into their paganism in order perhaps we can win them to Jesus. That's what, was, that's what happened, folks. That's the tragedy. So, December 25th was selected as the official day. In 350 AD, Pope Julius I declared December 25th as the birthday of the Son of God. Hence, the festival of Saturnalia was Christianized. All of the holidays, festivals, eating, drinking, lights, gifts, candles, carols, trees, eulog, mistletoes, all of those that were given to the God of Saturn were now given to the babe of Bethlehem. Did you get that? Will Durant summed it up perfectly. Christianity did not abolish paganism. It adopted it. Folks, this is the Christian message you don't want to hear. Let's stand.